So um, my name's Alex Dean, and uh, the title of my talk is Why Your Company Needs a Unified Log. Um, so first of all, kind of who, who am I? So um, my name's Alex Dean. I'm the co-founder of um, Snowplow Analytics. Um, Snowplow Analytics is an open source event analytics platform, uh, and we're actually based around the corner from here, very, very local. In my spare time, uh, I'm sort of working on a, a book about unified log processing. Um, so it's obviously kind of a, a topic close to my heart. Uh, and this, in this talk, I'll kind of explain, explain more about what it is and uh, why I'm so kind of excited about it. So kind of first off, what is a unified log? And just a quick show of hands, who, who's kind of familiar with the, the term at the moment? OK, a few people, but, but it's new to a lot of people here. Um, so rather than kind of dive into what a unified log is immediately, um, I want to do a little bit of a kind of um, a quick kind of history recap. Um, and the way, I, the way I kind of think of this, and I, I think different people have a di you know, different takes on it, but the way I think of it is that there have been kind of three eras of, of business data processing. Um, and I kind of split them into three eras called the classic era, the hybrid era, and the unified era. Um, and I have kind of rough dates against each of them. And notice that they all say kind of plus on the end. So none of these eras are over. There are companies doing all of these different approaches still and you know, being very successful on them. Um, I've also got kind of little pictures of, of people I think are kind of, uh, kind of defining characters of, um, of the eras, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go to those in a second. So, okay, so what is this, what is this kind of classic era that I'm talking about? Um, so the classic era of business data processing is basically the idea that from kind of 1996 onwards, uh, people were working with very kind of classical data warehouse, data integration, business intelligence approaches. And uh, that's a picture top right of, uh, who, does anyone recognize who that is? Kimball, exactly. That's Ralph Kimball up there, kind of the, 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 the father of the... Um, the kind of the, the data warehouse as we know it today. And so in that kind of classic era, we had, um, companies had, um, they had individual systems, so they had maybe CMSs, e-comm systems, ERPs, whatever, um, and those all had kind of individual silos of data. Um, they all had kind of what we call local loops, so they were all sort of doing a lot of decisioning internally themselves. They were also talking to each other, so there, there were lots of point-to-point -point connections being made, um, earning lots of money for kind of data integrator contractors, things like that. Um, and then I guess the, the, point of, the point of this from a sort of a, a, a data intelligence perspective is that what was typically happening was every night there was kind of a, a batch process typically that would suck the data out of all of those sort of pots um, and put it through into a, a data warehouse for some management reporting. And, you know, I think there are some notes here which are the, it was a high latency thing, so you only got your data every night, um, but you had very wide data coverage. So, you know, if the, if the integrations had been set up, you had a lot of interesting data sitting in that data warehouse. Um, and you had the full history. So, you know, you had the, the data from those systems going back, um, you know, from the, from the beginning of the process. And then management reporting would be done off that. And you know, there's a ton of companies that are still doing a lot like this today, and this is working well for them, but a lot of stuff has happened since. Um, and that, that kind of brings us on to what I'm calling sort of the hybrid era. That's a picture of Doug Cutting, so he's kind of the original Hadoop guy. Um, and that Hadoop is kind of part of, of, of kind of the, the explosion of stuff that, that came recently. So 2005 onwards, I'm, I'm calling this. Um, so what do we have? What's changed from the, uh, from the previous? So quite a lot has changed. There's an awful lot more going on now. So we've still got lots of narrow data silos. We've now kind of signed up to lots of SaaS vendors. So we've got lots of like external pots of data and we're sort of struggling to figure out how to get those into our systems. We're also, uh, we've still got our batch warehouse here. So this is, you know, this is still the same kind of technology and probably the same vendors and things like that from, from before. But we've now got other things as well. So we've also got some batch processing going into Hadoop. So we were kind of building a data lake in Hadoop. Um, we probably also got a lot better about monitoring our systems. Um, so we've probably got some, some independent monitoring processes going on there that are completely separate from the other flows. Um, and maybe we're, we're even exploring like stream processing, maybe Storm or uh, Spark Streaming, something like that. And maybe we're doing some quite cool real-time stuff there, like product recommendations or user churn or, or whatever. So 
we've got a, a, a much more complex picture, and actually this is a massive simplification. So a big enterprise, you know, there's way more systems like than this going on. Um, but this is kind of what we're calling the hybrid era. So yeah, a surfeit of, of software vendors. So there's just a lot of different companies, and you know, they're all solving slightly different problems, um, but there's very similar kind of methodologies. Um, so I've kind of overlaid a few things here. I mean, I, I had to sort of stop somewhere, but um, here I've got some uh, SaaS web analytics guys. Here I've got kind of Hadoop, some HDFS, HBase, some different kind of query engines and DSLs on top of Hadoop. Um, here we've still got like all the kind of the classic uh, business intelligence vendors all kind of competing and fighting for their kind of slice of the pie. Uh, systems monitoring, so we've got lots of uh, great like log collection tools. Uh, we've got like monitoring tools, all that kind of stuff. And then over here, um, you know, trying to, trying to kind of make sense of that data in real time, maybe we, we're exploring like Erlang or RabbitMQ or Storm. Uh, maybe we're putting kind of counts into Redis. Um, but the key point is there's a ton of different people trying to do quite siloed parts of, of this flow. And this kind of leads to, to a, a, a bigger problem, which I'm kind of calling the, the Rashomon problem. So essentially you're ending up with all of these different pieces of the solution that are all telling their own story. So if you're an analyst or you're a, an executive, you're a data scientist, the answer you give to a business question is gonna depend on where you went looking for the data. So you know, did you go looking in Storm because it was kind of to do with product recommendations? Did you go into your Hadoop, did you dive into your Hadoop data lake? Did you go, go back into your kind of classic proprietary data warehouse? Um, or did you pull it out of Splunk? And, and these are all separate flows today. Um, and so they're, they're, not, they're not telling the same story. The other problem with, with this approach is that just the number of data integrations is just getting more and more unsustainable. So you know, you start with two systems. That's great. You've got two connections to make. I can I can send data from A to B. I can send data from B to A. Then I've got four systems. Okay, I've got 12 connections to make. Still doable. Now I've got 16 systems, and this is just this is just the connections coming out of system F, whatever F is. Just that's just the lines out of F to all the other systems. So it's just it's expanding like crazy the number of data integrations we do. And um, I met up with a. Uh, uh, I, I used to, so to give a bit of background, before I was working on Snowplow, I used to, I used to do this kind of stuff. About 10 years ago, I joined um, Deloitte Consulting, and we did kind of classic BI for, um, for kind of retail banks. And I met up with a guy who, who's still doing that kind of 10 years on, I used to, I used to work with. And um, I said, are you still doing tons of this stuff? And he said, no, actually, all we do these days is just point-to-point -point data integrations, because it's just, there are just so many of them to do. So we're dealing with, so in the hybrid era, we've got a lot of new technologies that allow us to do cool new things like product recommendations or real-time monitoring of our systems or building a massive data lake in Hadoop. But we're getting a lot of complexity um, as those kind of point-to-point -point things increase. And we're also dealing with that kind of Rashomon-like like issue. So the question then becomes, well, how do you kind of unravel the hairball? because you're, you're dealing with a massive hairball. And this is where we kind of come on to the unified era. So the picture top right for the unified era, does anyone know who that is? Nope, that's Jay Kreps. He's one of the, um, uh, he's a kind of a, he, he's just left LinkedIn, but uh, he's kind of a senior committer to Apache Kafka. Um, so the basic idea of the, the unified era is that we start to unravel our systems. So in place of the kind of idea of that multiple channel approach, we put this thing called a unified log at the center of our architecture as a company. So what is a unified log? So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what it is as a technology in a second, but, but let's focus for now on kind of where it sits in the, in the infrastructure, in the architecture. The basic idea is that your systems now emit an event stream that goes into the unified log where possible, you get your SaaS vendors to emit an event stream from their systems as well. So if you're using SendGrid or um, Olark or any of those kinds of providers, they often have a kind of a webhook support. And you can plug in an endpoint for those webhooks and then you can start to collect all of their events as well because their events are crucial to your business just as much as events generated uh, in your own systems. 
So you, you start to ingest all of those events into this thing called the unified log. The unified log then has very wide data coverage. So you're kind of getting back to that classic era idea of having uh, you know, kind of all the data in one place. Now, the other nice thing about it is it's low latency. So you can actually do stuff with that data very, very quickly. So you're talking in terms of kind of seconds, not in terms of kind of the classic uh, long batch periods of before. The downside, you know, there's got to be a downside. This isn't sort of a magic technology, is that you can only normally keep a few days data history in it. Um, so one of the two main unified logs only supports 24 hours currently. Um, that's, that's the Amazon one, Kinesis. I'll talk about that in a second. The other one, Apache Kafka, you can kind of tune how many days worth of events you keep in it. Um, I think LinkedIn keeps like, I think, four weeks or, or something like that. Um, so, so that's your unified log. And then what do, you, what do you kind of do with the data coming out of the unified log? Well, you do a few things. So one of the most important things you can do is you just archive that and stick that into Hadoop. So as soon as you put that into Hadoop, you've now got the full archive. So Hadoop has got the exact same data as the unified log. It's just got the full history going back through time. So you know, that's where you're going to start collecting the years of data. What else do you do? Well, you can also then feed all your other systems. So we go from this kind of approach where all those channels are competing with each other from source to an approach where they're all, they're all feeding off the same data. And they'll tend to feed off maybe one or both of these. Um, so, you know, if you're just doing, if you want to do um, systems monitoring, you could just go off the unified log because you probably care about the last 24 hours of your system's uptime. If you're doing something very long range and maybe very bespoke or machine learning, something like that, you might go just off the data in Hadoop. So you might say, actually, I don't care about the, 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 the up to the minute data. Um, or you might um, have approaches that combine both, um, which is a bit like kind of the, the Lambda architecture that's been kind of spoken of earlier today. But the key point is that you're, you're, you're trying to get rid of that hairball and uh, recenter on a, on a technology called a unified log. So, so what is an actual unified log? Um, so at this moment, there are basically two of them. One is Apache Kafka, and that was kind of the, the, first, the first one out. Um, so Apache Kafka is an append-only, distributed, ordered commit log. So that's a lot of kind of things to pack in, but basically what it means is it's kind of a, you can think of it essentially as almost a distributed queue that has persistence and supports extremely, extremely high throughput. Um, and it was d developed at LinkedIn to serve as their organization's unified log. So the guys at LinkedIn have done a lot of communication about what a unified log is, um, how it applies to, uh, how Kafka kind of enables it for them. And uh, yeah, it's, it's well worth reading what they've been uh, putting out. Um, so that's Kafka with the slightly cryptic logo. Um, with the other slightly cryptic logo, you've got Amazon Kinesis. Um, Amazon Kinesis is a hosted AWS service. Um, the semantics are extremely similar to Kafka. So essentially, you know, you kind of choose your, choose your poison. So on this side, it's for the guys who maybe want to minimize cost a bit more, maybe aren't on Amazon, but don't mind opsing it themselves. On this side, it's great for people who are kind of already deep in the AWS ecosystem and, you know, don't want to be maintaining, you know, operation operations over that unified log. They, they want to know that it's just there and it's up and it's available. Um, so that's so that's kind of the unified log. And, and, and I think this kind of, this is a quote actually off the Kafka homepage, but I think this is kind of the key point. Kafka is designed to allow a single cluster to serve as the, date, the central data backbone for a large organization. So that is really this idea of, you know, your company needs a unified log, it, it needs only one. And that is the place that you're going to put all your event streams and, you know, kind of it scales to the kind of volumes that LinkedIn can put a month or, you know, about a month. I think Martin is speaking later and I'm sure he'll uh, correct me on the numbers. But, you know, it scales to the kind of volumes where LinkedIn can put a month in. So some smaller organizations, you could potentially put your full event history going back to the start of your business in Kafka or, or Kinesis. Well, maybe not Kinesis, actually, because of the 24-hour limit. So what does the unified log give us? Um, so it gives us a few things. We have a single version of the truth. So between um, the unified log plus Hadoop, we have a single version of the truth. They contain exactly the same data. Um, they just have different time windows on that data. So we're kind of going back to almost the classic era of data warehousing, but we're doing it in a very modern way uh, with extremely high throughput um, and, and low latency. 
Um, this is important as well. The single version of the truth is upstream from the data warehouse. So yes, you can go and get your answers from the data warehouse, but all the, all the other systems are using that same version of the truth as well, which is incredibly powerful. You don't, you don't end up with that weird conflict where you know, one team says, oh, this is the answer, and the other team say, well, I'm looking at a different data source, and, and this is the answer. Point-to-point -point connections have been unraveled, that kind of hairball. So we're, st we're stopping playing that kind of whack-a-mole game of like, okay, well, we've just uh, bought a new system, so let's get that data going into these three systems, and let's get those two systems' data going into this one. So we're starting to kind of un unravel that hairball and say, well, actually, systems need to talk to the unified log, and they need to read from the unified log. And unless they're trying to do something in like super real time, that should be enough for most purposes. Um, and a kind of going even further than that, local loops have been unbundled. So there's a lot of stuff that people just kind of bundle into um, real-time operational systems that maybe actually doesn't need to be. So you know, if you have, um, if you ha if you're in uh, retail and you're doing fraud detection, you might not actually need that that fraud decision in you know in the, the request response loop of the web page. It might be fine to farm it out to the unified log to a dedicated process that calculates that fraud score and returns it a couple of seconds later. So you're starting to kind of not only stop doing the point-to-point -point connections, but you're actually starting to pull some of the logic out of individual systems and make those systems kind of simpler. So there's, there's quite a few uh, advantages. Um, but what does it let us do that we couldn't do before? Um, because you know a lot of that stuff is kind of qualitatively better, but is it kind of coo cool new stuff? So here's, here's a few kind of cool new things you can do, and we're kind of actively exploring a, a few of them at Snowplow. So you can do real-time management reporting, kind of obviously, because the same data that's going to feed into your you know, um, uh, business data warehouse is available in stream uh, in the unified log. You can start to do holistic systems monitoring. So instead of just saying, well, this is the stuff I'm seeing in my you know, sysadmin as a monitoring tool, you can start to correlate that with you know, in-browser events or uh, you know, events to do with anything else. So essentially, you start to kind of look at the whole picture of what's happening in your in your business. Um, you could rerun models from day zero. So essentially, you just say, well, I want to um, I want to try a different definition of kind of um, you know uh, user churn or um, or customer lifetime value, and I will literally just rerun that across my full history because I have that available, and it's the same data in all my different systems. Um, and that's kind of related to this one, which is your analyst can work on like an offline model in you know, Redshift or, or something like that. And once they're ready with that, they can ship it over to you know, a real-time engine like Spark Streaming, and they'll know that that is basically, you know, th the assumptions they made will, will cross over because they're, they're using the same data set. Um, and this is kind of a cool one. So A-B testing of actual end-to-end -end pipelines. So one of the nice features of the unified log is you can have multiple apps consuming that, that log. So you can literally just spin up a new, uh, a new version of your, your, your processing pipeline, whatever that is trying to do, and just put that against it, and just run that against the data, compare it to the outputs of other things. So you go from kind of having one kind of brittle data architecture to the ability to just spin up a new one and try a new model. It's pretty cool. Um, but, but then we kind of come on to, you know, how do you actually make use of a, a unified log? So garbage in, garbage out, it's really important to model those event streams in a really good, robust way. Uh, because you know, this is gonna become the source of truth for your business. You're gonna have these events sitting on disk, uh, first in Kafka or Kinesis, and then in Hadoop, or maybe Amazon S3, and you've gotta kinda make that work. You've gotta, you've gotta make that a, a useful model for, for analytics and for, for all of your different systems. So there are kind of no, no firm answers at the moment. Um, one thing we're working on at Snowplow is a kind of a semantic model for events. Um, and the grammar borrows kind of heavily from human language. So we have the idea of a kind of an event context. So this is kind of the time, manner, place of the event. And then we have the idea of a subject of the event. Uh, so who's doing, the, who's doing the event, the verb of what they're doing, and then you know, different entities that are interacting in the event. So entities are kind of like snapshots of, of different things at, at a moment in time. So an example here might be for retail, shopper um, adds t-shirt to basket, and you're just snapshotting all of those things at, at, at the moment that the event takes place. Why is this important? This is really important because if you can come up with a strict model like this, um, you're basically reducing the risk of people making kind of business assumptions or technology assumptions. Um, in the way that they describe events. 
And if you can remove those assumptions, you're going to end up with a less brittle data store over time. So you're going to end up with better structured events um, versus kind of events where you go back and you say, you know, wh what's all the, what are all these strange references to, you know, technologies that we don't use anymore, um, or you know, business decisions or reports that we don't we don't care about anymore. So you kind of want to go back to the, the the raw, primitive events and and store those. Um, the other thing of that's really, really important, and we hadn't kind of appreciated this until we, until we started working on this stuff at Snowplow, is that you know, your events have to have some sort of structure, some sort of schema. Um, and the schemas have to live somewhere, and the schemas will evolve over time. So you know, businesses change their, their understanding of business problems. They change the events they care about. They change the entities that they're describing. So you've got to have a lot of kind of rigorous tech around that. Um, which is kind of you know new in a way, but but is kind of important. So this is this diagram basically suggests that you know if you've got maybe this is a games company that has uh, you know uh, some mobile ga uh, some uh, web games and a backend game server, maybe like a mobile game as well, and they're sending all those events into the unified log. And what we're what we're doing here is we actually open sourced a new project called Igloo, which is just all it does is it's just a repository server for JSON schemas. So literally, you just say, OK, well, this is the schema that represents this type of event, and I'll stick it in the repository server, and I'll just use that later. So you know, the unified log is really powerful, but you need to put a lot of thought into how am I going to structure my events, um, and how am I going to you know, store them in a way that's kind of robust going forwards. So how are we kind of embracing the, the unified log at, at Snowplow? So I, I know that kind of most of you will be coming to Snowplow Cold, so I've got a kind of a a very, very short introduction, because you know, this, this talk isn't about Snowplow, it's about the unified log. Um, Snowplow is an open source event analytics platform. We started it um, at the start of, of 2012. The, the itch we were trying to scratch was basically that we were working a lot with Google Analytics and uh, a little bit with Sitecat, uh, Omnitor Site Catalyst, as it was then, and we couldn't get access to the raw data. Um, so we, put, we basically put Snowplow together as a, a prototype to, to basically collect um, uh, browser data uh, and, and store it ourselves. So one thing we did early on is just decide that Snowplow should be uh, composed of a, a set of subsystems. So what we called them, so essentially we had trackers first. So those were for generating event data from any environment. Then we had collectors, uh, and that was all about logging raw events from a tracker or multiple trackers. Um, then enrichment, so validating and enriching the raw events. Uh, then storage, obviously, so you've got to put the enriched events uh, somewhere, and then analytics. So obviously, you know, you've got to analyze, or you want to do different analyses on the events. And th the funny kind of story about Snowplow is that we started and we sort of wanted to do all this really quickly, so we could do lots of fun analytics. And actually, this just ended up taking up all the time. So we don't we don't do a lot of analytics, but other other companies and partners do do more analytics on Snowplow data. So today, almost everyone is is running a batch based. Snowplow configuration. So what does that mean? That basically means we've got a set of event trackers um, that, that run in different platforms, including web and mobile. And those get collected, obviously, in kind of real time as they happen uh, with an event collector. But then this bit is all batch. So essentially, we have a Hadoop-based enrichment process. Um, and then the data goes into Amazon S3. And, uh, and then it gets loaded into Amazon Redshift as well. And we're kind of looking at other storage targets like um, BigQuery, which um, was uh, very cool to hear about this morning. So the kind of the, the 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 point here, and then analytics, so people can do what they want with the data afterwards. They've got the kind of the raw event stream. Um, but what's interesting here is that this is all batch based, um, and so most Snowplow users today are kind of running that every four to six hours. Um, so it's almost more in that kind of classic BI model of kind of you know as long as the the, the event data is ready for the analysts in the morning, they're kind of happy with it. Um, and I think another note is. This, this, this approach basically uses Amazon S3 as a kind of a poor man's unified log. So when the, um, so you know, this, this was the flow we had since uh, kind of partway through 2012. And when the, um, when all the kind of blogging about unified log started, and you know, uh, the guys at LinkedIn started to explain kind of their methodology and where they were taking Kafka, um, we sort of had an aha moment, and we were like, ah, okay, we've basically been using, we didn't know about unified logs, but we've basically been using Amazon S3 kind of as our unified log. So we've been using it as a way of kind of shunt shunting event stream data um, down the flow uh, and storing it as we go. So, so that's kind of the, the batch flow. 
And the obvious kind of question we asked, and we asked this kind of as soon as, um, we were asking it sort of before uh, Amazon Kinesis came out, but as soon as Amazon Kinesis came out, we were like, well, this is, this is great. This is an actual you know, proper unified log technology that we can use. And so the question became, can we implement Snowplow on top of Kinesis and Kafka? And, and this is basically what we've, been, what we've been doing. So we're working on Amazon Kinesis first um, because Snowplow has kind of historically been, been quite tied to AWS, so it sort of made sense to start there. Um, but I'll, I'll sort of talk through how this works. So you've still got the Snowplow trackers. There's, the, there's a new event collector that writes um, the incoming events to Kinesis. So then you've got a raw event stream of, uh, of events. Then there's a Kinesis enrichment app. So that's an app that reads in the, um, the raw stream and writes out the enriched event stream. So that's another, that's a new stream living in Kinesis. And it's also soon going to write out the, the bad event. So that's the events that, that failed um, validation. And the way I like to think of, um, the way I like to think of stream processing apps is, is basically like kind of distributed Unix um, kind of pipes, basically. So the way I think of this is this is essentially, it's got a standard in, and then it's got a standard out and a standard er. Uh, and that's quite, an, that's quite an easy pattern to, to kind of reason about and think about. And, and you can compose pretty interesting flows from, from doing that multiple times. So kind of this, all, this all kind of exists today. Um, and we're working on the next Kinesis release, which should be out in, in a week or two. Um, and, and kind of where does, it, where does it go? So what's kind of cool about the data? So um, this is how we get it into kind of the data lake. So this is just syncing the data. So we call, uh, we call like a storage app a sync. Um, so this is syncing the data into S3, so then you could you know, run Hadoop over it or whatever. This will drip feed the data into Redshift, so your Redshift database will be kind of up to date with almost the last few minutes worth of data. Um, Elasticsearch is super cool, um, so we're, we're big fans of Elasticsearch, and um, it'll be really cool to kind of get the data streaming into Elasticsearch, and then people can put Kibana on top of it and all that kind of stuff, um, so that's great. Um, and then also the idea of kind of aggregations. So I think the Amazon guys just released an aggregation app uh, kind of prepackaged for Kinesis this morning. And the basic idea there is that as the stream's coming in, you're basically just running lots of counts. So, you know, you might be counting, um, you know, uh, video plays on your website or whatever. And you're just doing that as you go. And you're storing that in probably a key value store like DynamoDB. Um, and the way we kind of divide these, these two areas out is we tend to divide them out into analytics on read versus analytics on write. So the basic idea is that analytics on read is where you don't really know what question you want to answer when you're coming to the data. So you put it all into storage and then when, you, when your analysts come to the data or your data scientists or you know, your ML algorithms, whatever, they can just kind of pick through all the data and figure out what they want to do. Analytics on write is much more about sort of dashboarding and things you need to do in real time. And that's where you're actually making kind of pre-canned decisions about what you want to do when the data is streaming in. So, you know, you decide uh, ahead of time that you care about the number of video plays per hour. And you literally have a little bit of code there counting that as it, as it comes in. So that's quite a, a useful distinction to make. Um, Snowplow kind of historically was all about analytics on read. But in a unified log world, analytics on write is really kind of doable and, and, and cool as well. So here we go, so a live demo. <laughs> what's, what's the live demo? So the live demo is I've set up, um, I've got a Scala stream collector ready to go, and I've got an enriched Kinesis app ready to go. And this is gonna write out to a stream. Uh, this is gonna read from the stream, but so we can see it happening, I'm actually just gonna write this one out to standard out. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna push it back into a new stream. So let's get this going. So this window up here should be for my collector, so my event collector. Um, bum, bum, bum. Let's see. Hang on a sec. That one should do it. So that's a Snowplow stream collector version 010 with a, com uh, with a local config file. So let's just see. Let's just get that working. So that's starting up now. That's quite nice. It's quite visible what it's doing. Okay, so that should be... That should be sort of ready and waiting. Now I'm going to, um, what was that one? Now I'm going to set up ngrok. Does anyone, do, do you guys know what ngrok is? It's a, it's a way of kind of um, mirroring a local server to, to, um, to the ngrok website. So if I hit this, ngrok 8080, that should put me 
That should put me online, I think. So now we need to just do a quick test of that. So if we do that, um, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I should probably, actually no, that's fine. So if we do that, so, oh no, hang on, it's probably given me a new, oh no, it gave me the same one as before, fine. So that that's working. So Ngrok is um, talking to my local collector and my collector, yeah, my collector has got it coming in and my collector should be writing it out to, yeah, 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 yeah. so it's writing out to Kinesis, the event. So that's, that's kind of local. Now I'm gonna set up the enrichment process. So this is the, set the second app. And this, you know, this is all kind of basic local, locally set up, so I've only got like one instance of everything. But the key point is all this stuff kind of scales horizontally really easily. Well, it, yeah, it scales horizontally. <laughs> um, so that is not, that should be it. Let's see if that starts working. Okay, cool. Can you guys see that? So I'll just, I'll just do that. Okay, so that should be, that should be going. All right, and now, okay, so that should be working. Now I'm gonna do something slightly crazy, which is, I'm gonna go into the Snowplow website. I don't recommend doing this normally, but I'm gonna go to the Snowplow page tracking and I'm gonna add in a new collector. So basically, um, so to kind of explain what I'm doing, so the Snowplow Analytics website has Snowplow tracking set up on it, so it has the Snowplow JavaScript tracker set up on it. Now, you can send, with, the, with Snowplow, you can send the events to multiple endpoints. So you can see that at the moment it's sending it to uh, two collectors, two event collectors. One is on CloudFront and the other is, uh, is on Beanstalk. So I'm gonna now, I hope this works, I'm gonna now add in, um, oops, I'm gonna now add in a new tracker. And then I'm gonna save this. Google Tag Manager is like incredibly complicated. Cre I think I create version, and then I think I publish it. I think I do that, okay. All right, let's see if this works. So now we're on the Snowplow website, so I'm gonna sort of browse around it a bit. Okay, so hopefully, oh yeah, look, can you see that, guys? Going to Ngrok. It just, it just did a bit of chatting to Ngrok. So let's look and see what's happening here. So Ngrok can see it. Let's see what's happening in the Kinesis. Oh, there we go. Ah, good. The stress of the live demo is... So, okay, so what's happening? So basically, the events are going to the... They're going via Ngrok to the, the local event collector. The event collector is writing them to Kinesis. And then the Kinesis enrichment process is running on them and just spooling out to standard out. So what you can basically see here is um, you can see that uh, someone's browsing the site from London. It thinks they're on Linux, so that might not be me. Uh, let's scroll up a bit. Let's see what else we can see. Yeah, so, so that's it, basically. That's it coming through. And you can see the... Um, you can see here, this is the version stamp of the collector. So this is, um, so each event, each Snowplow event gets tagged with the collector that's running it. And this is the version of the enrichment process. So that's the enrichment process that's running on the data. And this is the format, like the, the we need to update the Snowplow event format, but basically we uh, the format we had was kind of very sort of Redshift friendly, basically, Redshift and Postgres friendly. So we're gonna update it, but that's that's essentially one long kind of 90 column TSV of sort of web analytics data that's being spat out. Um, Let's see if we can do a couple more events. Someone on Windows phone? Cool. Anyway, so so that is um so that's that. That was the live demo. So um that kind of takes me on to probably a bit ahead of time, but um it kind of takes me on to questions. Um and uh, that's that's just a remorseless plug for the book. And um, actually, Manning did a they've got a they've got a code for the whole of Span, so you can get forty three percent off any Manning ebook with Span C for the win. <laughs>